So for the Schmidt Grammar Book, Chapter 9 Lecture, uh, we're talking mainly about the academic uses of adjective clauses and phrases and introducing the new topic of cleft sentences. Advance here, sorry. There we go. All right, so these are the main uses of adjective clauses or adjective phrases. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro in the, um, at the very beginning of the other video, uh, these uh, adjective clauses, adjective phrases, and adverb phrases are a more sophisticated use of language when we start looking at more macro st structures, looking at the clauses. Um, we're getting into more sophisticated uses, and so they're far better for academic writing. So as adjectives do, they are used to describe mainly. Uh, they can be used to identify, to define, give examples, predict, provide historical perspective, provide comments, or indicate a date. So these are frequently useful for the author to give that which they are describing. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last week in class, but the um, adjective clauses and adjective phrases can be uh, separated from the main clause. Remember the adjective uh, clauses are dependent clauses or subordinate clauses. They don't stand alone. And they are separated from the main clause either most frequently by commas, but you as a writer can also choose to use parentheses or dashes to separate them off. Um, think of this. A comma is a short pause. A parenthesis is a bit of a longer pause, and a dash is an even longer pause if you were to speak. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so um, it separates the adjective clause or phrase even more from the other from the rest of the sentence. So it depends on how much of a pause you as the writer or the speaker would like to have or how much separation would you like to have between the subordinate clause and the dependent clause. So you as, this, as the writer, you have some uh, stylistic devices that you can choose from depending on your intentions. So let's talk about cleft sentences. This is an interesting structure. Uh, look at these two sentences, and um, in your opinion, is there a difference? So in number one, we have students enjoy vacations, or it is vacations that students enjoy. In number two, Steve Jobs created the smartphone. In letter B, it was Steve Jobs who created the smartphone. So what do you think the difference is in these two sentences? And take a moment and think about it and respond in your in your mind or out loud to yourself what would how would you describe the difference so obviously there is a difference i didn't ask if there was one or not but what is the difference so in the second one in letter b in both cases it's kind of like passive voice in that it's um, changing the emphasis in the sentence. So in number one, we took the object and made it uh, more prominent in the sentence by moving it to the front. So we're emphasizing now vacations as opposed to students. So it, we're um, changing the emphasis by changing the location in the sentence. So where's our verb in that sentence? Uh, let's use our little annotation device here. So I want to use uh, 
Yes. So is is our verb. Right? So we'll highlight that. Sorry, not sure how this works. Well, let's try a different way. Let's try draw. Draw will be better. So is that's our verb. And what kind of verb is that? Is it a transitive verb, an intransitive verb, or a linking verb? And we know that the verb to be is usually a linking verb. And so what does it connect? What does it link? It links the subject with the predicate. Remember that the predicate is the rest of the sentence. It's the verb plus the rest. So if we know where our verb is, we know where our subject is. It's just to the left of the verb. So here it, our subject is it. And it's, so the linking verb is connecting it to vacations that students enjoy. So in this case, um, what is it? Is it a thing? Is it like the dog enjoys vacations? No, it in this case is nothing. It's what we call a dummy subject. So it takes the place of sub in the sentence in, in terms of the syntax, but in fact, it is nothing here. It, it's not a thing. It's like when you say, it is hot today. Well, what's hot? Well, the climate, the weather, you know, it, it's not specific. So it's what we call a dummy subject. So in this cleft sentence, um, structure, we have uh, what we call a dummy subject. So let's look at it again in the second um, sentence. So we have Steve Jobs created the smartphone. In letter A, what is our verb? Here it is, created, that's our verb. What kind of verb is it? Is it transitive, intransitive, or linking? So we can say that it's a transitive verb. We have, to the left of the verb, we have our subject, that's Steve Jobs. And he created the smartphone. So it's a transitive verb. We have, he created something. So this is our direct object. This is what he created. He created the smartphone. Now, in our cleft sentence here, we didn't change the order like we did in number one. It's still Steve Jobs who is prominent. That's still what we want to emphasize. We want to emphasize the creator, not the object that was created. But by using the cleft sentence, we add that it plus the verb to be structure to create the cleft sentence. We still focus on Steve Jobs and what he did, who created the smartphone. So here we have, and what, what kind of structure is this? Who created a smartphone? What would you call this? This is an adjective clause, right? It's describing Steve Jobs. So inside our adjective clause, here's our clause here, remember that we have a, in order to be a clause, what do we need? We need a subject and a verb. So where's our verb? Our verb inside the adjective clause is created. Our subject is who, and what did he create? The smartphone. So we do have a subject and a verb, and we even have an object because it's a transitive verb. This whole structure here is a, an adjective clause describing um, the noun Steve Jobs, the proper noun Steve Jobs. But it's still an active sentence, right? It's not a passive structure, but it is this cleft sentence structure that allows us to give more emphasis to Steve Jobs. The first sentence, Steve Jobs created the smartphone, has the exact same <clears throat> content, basically, as the second part, Steve Jobs, who created the smartphone. But by using this cleft sentence structure, we're emphasizing Steve Jobs. We're drawing attention to it. So we're really calling attention to his name. He's a famous, important person. And this is why he's important, because he created the smartphone, which is something that has really revolutionized communications in the uh, 21st century. So um, it's a device, it's a syntactical device that we can use to draw the reader's attention or the listener's atten attention, excuse me, to certain um, 
content in the sentence. So cleft sentences are um, an important way to draw attention in writing. It's used very commonly in academic writing. Let's move on here. <clears throat> oh, so annoying. Sorry about that. Okay, moving along. Cleft means separate. So it separates. A cleft is a divide. Um, have you ever heard of somebody who has a cleft palate? It's a birth defect where um, babies are born and they have a separation in the hard palate, which is the hard part, uh, the bony structure in the roof of your mouth. So sometimes babies are born and that does not close properly. So they might have speech difficulties. Sometimes there's a split in the upper lip and they need to have a surgery where the doctors will um, sew the upper lip together. So this is a separation in the palate and or the lip. So cleft means separate. So it's a separate sentence. Do you see how we separate the structure? Um, and we have that it was so-and-so who did something else. And that's the name cleft sentence. So cleft sentences are complex sentences that contain a noun, a noun phrase, or a noun clause in the independent clause, followed by an adjective clause, which is used for emphasis. So you have two clauses, a dependent clause and an independent clause. And um, this is an adjective clause type structure. That's why it's in this sentence or in this chapter. So a simple sentence can express the same idea as a cleft, as we saw in the two previous examples, but it does not focus on any particular structure in the same way that the cleft sentence does. So cleft sentences, let's say usually start with it plus b followed by a noun, and then a prepositional, or a noun, a prepositional phrase, or a noun clause, or an adverbial clause clause that is emphasizing that is emphasized by having an adjective clause following um, so uh, I'm sorry about that in this case I should have uh, changed that because we're not looking at a specific case here there uh, so and the reason I said that in the first one here that we should change the word always like in grammar you can almost never say always so there are forms of cleft sentences, but let's just leave it at this for the time being. And this is the one that we're going to focus on here. The it cleft sentences are the most common structure, and it's the one that we find in academic writing. So some authors use them a lot, and it's a way to bring emphasis, as we mentioned before. So um, this is a good opportunity for us to look at topics that we will include in our second phase of our um, case study. So by today, you will upload the first draft of your case study, and you will send it directly to your partner, who is going to provide you feedback on your case study. So remember, I described this to you last week in class. I showed you not very well, but how to use uh, track changes. And please recall that you, for the second round of the case study, what you're supposed to do, this is what we call the peer analysis. And in the peer analysis, you have a couple of different tasks. One, you need to use track changes and try to correct everything that you can inside your friend's paper. Um, do as thorough a job as you possibly can. I understand that it's difficult. Sometimes people make a lot of mistakes in their paper and it's very difficult for you to do all of it. I don't want to hear any whining or complaining about having to do that because that is exactly what Sean and I do with all of your papers. So suck it up. That's what teachers do. So you're performing the role of teacher here and you're acting like your partner is your student. And so you're going to use this technological device called Track Changes, which you can find in Microsoft Word. 
There is a tutorial available in Blackboard inside the case study folder that shows you how to use track changes and you are to provide feedback to your partner correcting as much as you can. Now that being said, sometimes when you're um, in your continuum, remember in interlanguage between the L1 and the target language, so when you yourself are somewhere along this continuum and haven't reached mastery, which is very difficult to do, but let's say you're here in your second language acquisition, it's going to be very hard for you to provide feedback to your partner um, on structures that you yourself have not yet mastered. I understand that. I know where you are in your second language acquisition. So do your level best. Do your ability. You will only be able to identify those errors that you yourself um, have mastered that structure. So if you haven't mastered the structure, it's unlikely that you'll be able to provide correct, correct feedback to your partner on those structures. So I understand that and I take that into consideration in your grading. However, because I do understand where you are in your um, language acquisition, I expect you to do um, as much as you can. So I know what structures you should be able to identify and what ones you may not. Um, number two, you need to provide comments to your partner. So that's also part of um, track changes. It can be found under the revisions ribbon in Microsoft Word. And you are expected to be sufficiently tech savvy to be able to do that. This is the 21st century and English language teaching requires some knowledge of technology. So that's what we teach in this program. You have a course specifically on um, uh, technology and using technology in the English language teaching, which is a prerequisite to the program. That's Peggy Marcy's course, the 521. And you should take that towards the beginning of your program. I don't know if she teaches track changes or word uh, comments, but the point being that you need to understand some technology. Every once in a while I get somebody in this program who has zero technology competence and um, that's not an excuse. This is where you learn it. This is a master's program and in order to be an effective teacher in this day and age, you need to understand some things about technology. So, um, looks like I might lose my PowerPoint here in a minute. If that's the case, no problem, because we're going to start a new video for Chapter 10 anyhow. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about your assignments and what you're working on. So I'll stop sharing my screen, and I'll get back to the um, PowerPoint in a minute. Um, but to carry on about the next assignment that is due, that's your um, peer analysis. Um, so, as I was saying, the second task that you have in the peer analysis is to provide feedback to your partner using the comment boxes. So you can provide feedback on the structure of their paper, on the headings, on the formatting, Remember that for the headings, you're supposed to use the Graduate Dean Study Guide. So for um, levels one, two, and three, otherwise known as A, B, and C. So one is A, two is B, three is C. Um, you need to refer to the Graduate Dean Study Guide. Level one or level A is the title of your paper. Level B or level two are the um, major sections of your paper. So as I've said before, you may have divided in your, your paper into the social, psychological, and linguistic aspects of second language acquisition, um, or whatever title you want to give it, however you wanted to divide it up. So the formatting for those is on the left margin and in sentence case. That means the first letter and proper nouns are capitalized only. And it's not in bold, it's not in italics, and it's not underlined, but it's on the left margin. Level three, or level C, is uh, centered. So those are the smaller sections underneath the 
um, B or two level headings. For the level C or level three headings, you need to put them in the center. They're also in sentence case, and they are also not underlined, not in bold, and not in italic. So the only difference is that level C or level three is in the center, whereas level B or level two is on the left margin. Both are sentence case. Neither are underlined in italics or bolded. So I hope everybody can figure that out. I don't know why every quarter we always have a ton of difficulty for that. It's not that hard. Um, <clears throat> third, your task is to use comment boxes to identify a minimum of 10 either grammar errors or exemplary uses of grammar in English. So this is an appropriate time for us to be studying chapters nine and 10, because these are the types of structures that you may identify as exemplary uses. I don't want to just focus on errors. Let's focus on getting to the target language. Let's focus on people who have native-like competency in English and uh, identify that and um, applaud their acquisition of the language. So if you find 10 errors, fine. If you find 10 exemplary uses, fine. If you find a mix and match of the two, wonderful. So you can find three exemplary uses and seven errors, minimum. If you want to identify more, by all means, please go ahead and go above and beyond, which I suggest that you do, so that you can get full points on this assignment. 10 is the minimum requirement. If you want to do more, you can and should. For these 10 comment boxes, specifically only these 10, not the other comment boxes that you use to provide feedback on structure, on formatting, on APA, on the content. Don't forget to provide positive feedback as well. Remember, we've studied motivation is very important for students who are learning another language, but also you might want to give some positive comments to your friend and say, oh, great job, uh, excellent idea. I hadn't thought of that. This is a very well-written section. I like this topic sentence. I like the way you've divided your ideas. Excellent conclusion, etc. cetera. Um, but in your third requirement for this paper, you are where you identify the 10 exemplary uses or the 10 errors and or errors, um, you have uh, to do three things inside the comment box. One is number the comment boxes. Draw my attention to these 10. So number them one, two, three, four, five through 10. And if you have more, carry on the numbering. Do not number all of the comment boxes. Only number those comment boxes which are to draw my attention to the exemplary use or the error. Two you need to cite the grammar rule that you are identifying. Um, is this an exemplary use or is it an error? And what exactly is the rule of the grammar according to our textbook, according to Schmidt? Um, state the rule exactly. And um, if it's an error, state how the sentence should be corrected. Number three. Identify the page number on which you can find this grammar rule in our textbook. So I hope that's clear. To summarize, you need to do three different things in this assignment. One, use, this is the um, peer analysis assignment, which is due next week. I can't remember if it's next week or the week after. Anyway, check your syllabus. Um, I can check in a moment. but. For the peer analysis assignment, number one, first of all, very first of all, save it with your name. So it's your name, underline, peer analysis, and then you upload it to Blackboard. Blackboard. Do not put your friend's name in the file name. I need your name. It's your assignment. You're getting the grade on it. So save it with your file name, underline, peer analysis. Okay, so the requirements for the assignment, the three requirements. Number one. 
use track changes to correct all the errors that you possibly can. Two, use comment boxes to provide feedback to your friend, both positive feedback as well as feedback on structure, APA formatting, citations, references, omissions in your case study, comments, etc. Three, identify at least 10 errors or exemplary uses of uh, English language, number the boxes, cite the rule that you're drawing attention to, and give the page number where that rule can be found. So um, there is a list in Blackboard that identifies exactly which types of um, exemplary uses you may identify. It can't be simple structures. It needs to be complex structures. That's the word exemplary. It's a very, very high level of English language usage that we're drawing attention to. So basically the concepts that you find in chapters nine and 10 from Seville Troiki. But there's a list there in Blackboard that you can utilize for exemplary uses. For the grammar errors that you're drawing attention to, do not draw attention to the same kind of error. So if you find an error with um, um, the usage of a comma in um, adjective clauses, that's one. You can only do, call my attention to that error once. Then you need to find a different kind of error. Don't draw attention to the same kind of error more than once. In your numbered boxes, if you want to draw attention to it, otherwise, please feel free to do so. But in your minimum of 10 numbered boxes, they need to be 10 unique, different kinds of errors or exemplary uses that you're drawing our attention to. I hope that's clear. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this video here. And then I will carry on with part three, which is Schmidt chapter 10. Thank you.